Let's start, though, with the year before, September 11th. We have a piece of primary source evidence. We have another Congressional Research Service report. November 3rd, 2000, the day before the 2000 presidential election, we have a report on the Persian Gulf. This report focuses almost exclusively on two main countries, Iran and Iraq. Quote, in May 1993, the Clinton administration articulated a policy of dual containment of Iran and Iraq. The administration explained the policy as an effort to keep both Iran and Iraq strategically weak simultaneously, in contrast to past policies that sought to support either Iran or Iraq as a counterweight to the other. Obviously, during the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, the United States sided with our enemy's enemy, Saddam Hussein. Dual containment. 1993, through here, 3 November 2000. And while this report focused extensively on Iran and Iraq, there was mention on page 11 of a certain Osama bin Laden. You find, quote, at large in Afghanistan is an exiled Saudi opposition figure, Osama bin Laden, who is not a religious authority, but is viewed by some Saudis as a revolutionary Islamic figure who is fighting to expel U.S. influence from Saudi territory. Some observers maintain that many Saudis privately agree with bin Laden the Saudi regime has turned the kingdom into a vassal state of the United States. Bin Laden supporters and other Islamic activists are present in the other Gulf states, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and there are occasional reports of specific threats to U.S. forces or personnel, but they do not pose a major challenge to the other regimes. That's true. Al-Qaeda was not going to overthrow any governments in the region. But obviously, we missed the signs here. We missed them badly. Osama bin Laden is treated as a marginal, charismatic figure here in the CRS report, 3 November 2000. If we skip ahead a year to August 6, 2001, we have a remarkable piece of primary source evidence. It's a PDB, President's Daily Brief, prepared by the intelligence services. This is something the President gets every day. And on August 6, 2001, the PDB was entitled, and Laden determined to strike in U.S. Salient points. There's a, an historical aspect, if you will. We'll come back to that term later. An historical aspect in this document, charting back to the 1993 first attack on the World Trade Center with a truck bomb. Resulted in a lot of casualties, but very, very few fatalities, and obviously the buildings remain standing. This PDB maintains that the World Center trade bombing 1993 was an Al-Qaeda attack. Moreover, the embassy bombings, uh, a trial for one of the uh, defendants in these bombings is happening right now. Simultaneous truck bombings in Kenya and Tanzania of the U.S. embassies also blamed on Al-Qaeda and the so-called Millennium Plot intended to blow up LAX, also is argued here as an Al-Qaeda attack. But that's not all. It's not all at all. We find, moreover, quote, Al-Qaeda members, including some who are U.S. citizens, have resided in or traveled to the U.S. for years. 
and the group apparently maintains a support structure that could aid attacks. FBI information indicates patterns of suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attack, including recent surveillance federal buildings in New York. Suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparations for hijackings. August 6, 2001, Bin Laden determined to strike in the U.S. President's Daily Brief, 6 August 2001. Five weeks later, Americans awoke to an unusual story on their television screen. Yeah. Ms. Justin, you were looking at some, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. CNN Center right now is just beginning to work on this story, obviously calling our sources and trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating happening this morning there on the south end of the island of Manhattan. That is, once again, a picture of one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Well, you can see these pictures, it's obviously uh, something devastating has happened. And again, unconfirmed reports that a plane has crashed into one of the towers there. We are efforting more information on this subject as it becomes available to you. In the span of 23 minutes, we went from confused to terrified. 9.03 a.m., the second plane hits the second tower. And it becomes obvious this was no accident. Late that afternoon and early evening, President Bush went on national television to address frightened nation. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, 
I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day. Yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night. And God bless America. Hmm. It's a bad day. September 12th, things began to come into focus. What we're going to watch now is a clip from a documentary. It explores the reaction, especially the reaction in the Muslim world to September 11th. But then, just a few hours later, President Khatami issued a statement condemning the attacks. It was a very important move for Iran. This is a march in Tehran on September 12th. Death to terrorists is the chant. Not death to America. Death to terrorists. The man just interviewed, Vice President of Iran at the time, Vice President to President Khatami man who is still instrumental in Iranian politics and who has supported Mir Hussein Mousavi in the current electoral crisis. In Iran, this is Iran condemning this. I can't emphasize how shocking and important that is. In North Tehran, Thousands took to the streets to express sympathy with America. More importantly, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, also spoke out against the attacks. That's the damn he that Hiroshima. Mass killing is wrong. Whether it's in Hiroshima, Bosnia, New York, or Washington. This is the supreme leader, the Velayati Faki, the Ayatollah Khamenei, successor to Khomeini in 1989. Oh, now, Kazakhi was it? Kazakhi was it? Kazakhi was it? 
And that week at Friday prayers, the ritual Death to America chants were dropped for the first time since the revolution. For Iran's leaders, it's important to have enemies. The reformists made great attempts to ban slogans that insulted the American people. Atahi and the president, Mohammad Khatami, were leaders of Iran's reform movement, hoping to improve ties with America. Suspending the death to America chance was a political decision made at the highest level. Iran's change of tone was noticed in Washington as the Bush administration prepared to invade Afghanistan, Iran's neighbor. Iran initially. Uh, we had discussions with right after 9-11, we made it very clear. This is the Deputy uh, Secretary of State, second to Colin Powell, Richard Armitage. We're going to see him again, the 9-11 Commission report. I believe he was also part of the panel of experts responding uh, to the 2003 diplomatic overture by Iran that we saw in the last set of lectures. Although we would be kinetically involved in Afghanistan, uh, that we bore no ill will to Iran, and the Iranians accepted this. So initially, uh, things were on an even keel. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The U.S. accepted Iran's help in Afghanistan. Sunni extremists like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban were also enemies of Iran's Shia regime. Very important point. We shared. Iran is a Shia country. Al-Qaeda, as we are going to see, is not Shia. They are Sunni. Moreover, the Taliban, Sunni, Pakistan, their support, Sunni. Iran has no love lost. Taliban or for Al Qaeda. And here, fall and winter of 2001, Iran was significantly helping the U.S. war in Afghanistan. Uh, in general, the stability in Afghanistan would very much benefit everybody. But the Iranians were not unhelpful, uh, mostly by staying out of the way. Iran encouraged its allies, the Northern Alliance, to fight alongside U.S. special forces. Within weeks, the Taliban collapsed. This was Iran's first major effort to help the United States to topple the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. This would have been impossible without Iran's help. In fact, Hamid Karzai took charge in Kabul only after Iran had broken an impasse with the Northern Alliance. We've been negotiating with them you know, for all these months, and it culminates with the Iranians basically telling the people that they had a relationship with to get out of the way <laughs> for the American, you know, the pro-American Afghans to, to stand up and take control. The Iranians thought legitimately that they had done um, a tremendous amount to help us and to help Afghanistan. The White House decided it couldn't trust Iran's government. Our second goal is to prevent regimes that sponsor terror from threatening America or our friends and allies with weapons of mass destruction. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror, while an unelected few repress the Iranian people's hope for freedom. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. This is the State of the Union Address, like January 2002, one of our pieces of primary source evidence. It's where the term axis of evil originates. Iran was shocked. The president, the vice president of Iran, rightly believed that they had done a great deal in Afghanistan to help Operation Enduring Freedom. 
their reward is to be lumped in with their bitter enemy, Iraq, and North Korea, the axis of evil. Not what they had hoped would be the result of their assistance. Iran's response was immediate, and President Hatami was thrown on the defensive. The reformists felt undermined by Washington at a crucial time. The very least expectation we had at the height of our struggles for real reform was not to be branded like this. Politically, it was an odd thing to do. We helped overthrow the Taliban. Instead of opening a path for even greater cooperation, they turned to this slogan, the axis of evil. That was Mr. Bush's biggest strategic and political blunder. In fact, behind closed doors in Washington, one of the arguments for invading Iraq was the possible impact on its neighbor, Iran. I think the idea in the minds of some who were so enthusiastic about invasion of Iraq was twofold. One, that Iraq, which was much more kindly disposed to the United States, would give us the ability, should we want to, to be able to pressure Iraq on the use of facilities, military facilities in, in Iraq. Secondarily, this is certainly the presence of democracy in Iraq and have a very positive effect on the other states. I heard the president say exactly that. If you went to war, overthrew Saddam, it would empower those in Tehran who really wanted to push for a different kind of, of political order. Flint. This is Flint Leverett, important member of the National Security Council, under Condoleezza Rice. You can see that already, very soon, after the September 11th attacks, war preparations were beginning for the second Gulf War, the invasion of Iraq. Leverett, a senior director for Mideast policy at the National Security Council, was skeptical. It was a nice idea, completely out of touch with the way that Iranian politics and society work, and fundamentally rooted in ignorance about the region. A new regime in Iraq would serve as a dramatic and inspiring example of freedom for other nations in the region. What we're going to watch now is a special address, a joint session of Congress and President Bush on September 20th, nine days after the attacks. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. Americans are asking, why do they hate us? They hate what they see right here in this chamber, a democratically elected government. Their leaders are self-appointed. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. They want to overthrow existing governments in many Muslim countries, such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. They want to drive Israel out of the Middle East. They want to drive Christians and Jews out of vast regions of Asia and Africa. These terrorists kill not merely to end lives, but to disrupt and end a way of life. With every atrocity, they hope that America grows fearful retreating from the world and forsaking our friends. They stand against us because we stand in their way. 
were not deceived by their pretenses to piety. We have seen their kind before. They are the heirs of all the murderous ideologies of the 20th century. By sacrificing human life to serve their radical visions, by abandoning every value except the will to power, they follow in the path of fascism, Nazism, and totalitarianism. And they will follow that path all the way to where it ends, in history's unmarked grave of discarded lies. I didn't win this war. We will direct every resource at our command, every means of diplomacy, every tool of intelligence, every instrument of law enforcement, every financial influence, and every necessary weapon of war to the disruption and to the defeat of the global terror network. Now this war will not be like the war against Iraq a decade ago with the decisive liberation of territory and a swift conclusion. It will not look like the air war above Kosovo two years ago where no ground troops were used and not a single American was lost in combat. Our response involves far more than instant retaliation and isolated strikes. Americans should not expect one battle, but a lengthy campaign, unlike any other we have ever seen. It may include dramatic strikes, visible on TV, and covert operations, secret even in success. We will starve terrorists of funding, turn them one against another, drive them from place to place until there is no refuge or no rest. And we will pursue nations that provide aid or safe haven to terrorism. Every nation and every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Great harm has been done to us. We have suffered great loss. And in our grief and anger, we have found our mission and our moment. Freedom and fear are at war. The advance of human freedom, the great achievement of our time and the great hope of every time, now depends on us. Our nation, this generation, will lift the dark threat of violence from our people and our future. We will rally the world to this cause by our efforts, by our courage. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. I will not forget the wound to our country and those who inflicted it. I will not yield, I will not rest, I will not relent in waging this struggle for freedom and security for the American people. The course of this conflict is not known, yet its outcome is certain. Freedom and fear, justice and cruelty have always been at war, and we know that God is not neutral between them. Fellow citizens, citizens will meet violence with patient justice, assured of the rightness of our cause, and confident of the victories to come. In all that lies before us, may God grant us wisdom, and may he watch over the United States of America. Thank you. Afghanistan is a long one. 
It is a tortured one, and it is a tragic one. We're going to learn about the Taliban. We're going to learn about their ally, Al-Qaeda, and how we got to a situation in which radical Islamists like the Taliban were able to take control of this country and give safe haven to a group like Al-Qaeda. The story begins 30 years ago. Oops, I knocked into the camera there. 30 years ago, 1979. 1979 is the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan ostensibly to protect what they claimed was a democratically elected socialist government. Of course, it was in no way, shape, or form the case. The invasion by the Soviets, by what the natives termed a godless people, led to native resistance, not surprisingly. Native resistance, but in Arabic, is called Mujahideen. It's a catch-all term, and it can be spelled a variety of ways. You may have seen it spelled slightly differently than that. This is because Arabic, as we've seen, is transliterated, and we are simply, in English, writing the sounds of the words. Mujahideen, you can translate as resistance fighter, freedom fighter, militiaman, armed guerrilla, what have you, standing up to the forces of the immensely more powerful Soviet Union. As this was a Cold War, if the Soviets are somewhere, well, the United States is not going to be far behind. The United States' response politically to the invasion of Afghanistan was to boycott the 1980 Moscow Olympics by the order of President Jimmy Carter. But that's not all. Because soon after the Soviets arrive, Americans arrive in the form of the CIA. In fact, there was a Tom Hanks movie made quite recently called Charlie Wilson's War, which is about American and CIA aid to the Mujahideen. For those uh, fans of the James Bond films, one of the uh, Timothy Dalton pictures I can't remember the name of it from the 1980s, is meant to take place in an Afghanistan which is being partially occupied by the Soviet Union. Spies like us, Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase from I think 1984, also takes place partially in Afghanistan. You're probably all too young to have even heard of those movies, but maybe you have so we have then, during the 1980s, the Soviets and the Americans fighting another one of our proxy wars, as had been fought in various places around the world during the second half of the 20th century. In 1988, a defeated Soviet Union exits stage left. They pull their troops out. What has often been called the Soviet Vietnam ends tragically, and some Soviet experts argue that the catastrophe, the nearly 10-year catastrophe in Afghanistan was a contributing factor to the collapse of the Soviet system three years later. Whether that's true or not, this quagmire certainly did not help an ailing Soviet state. In 1988, they leave. Well. If the Soviets are no longer there, guess who is no longer interested in being there? Us. The United States of America and the CIA also leave Afghanistan shortly after the Soviets. This leaves a power vacuum. A power vacuum that by 1996 will be filled with Islamist Mujahideen, who now call themselves the Taliban. The name Taliban derives from the word Talib, which simply means student in Arabic. The Taliban called themselves the students of Islamic knowledge. And in 1996, they took control of Kabul 
and the government of Afghanistan instituting a very strict Islamist vision of society. An Islamist vision that makes culture in Saudi Arabia seem positively free and open by comparison. Women's rights were non-existent. Religious minorities' rights were non-existent. You were either with the Taliban or you were against them. There was no middle ground in this debate. One of the outside aids to the Mujahideen, besides the United States of America, was a young Saudi man. Osama bin Laden. We briefly met Osama and we discussed Saudi Arabia because it's his father's family in the form of the bin Laden group, which is the primary construction company in Saudi Arabia and is responsible for nearly all of the major projects that the Saudi royal family has undertaken in the last 20 or 30 years. It's a massive company, extraordinarily valuable, Estimates are that it's worth $36 billion. And it's this wealth that will allow Osama bin Laden to go to Afghanistan during the 1980s and to join the fight against the godless Soviet invaders. The name of his headquarters in Afghanistan was simply the base or the headquarters in Arabic, which is Al-Qaeda, thus the name of the organization. We have a excellent piece of secondary source scholarship on Al-Qaeda. It's written by Jason Burke, 2004, Foreign Policy Magazine. Burke lays out nine misconceptions about Al-Qaeda. Here in this article, what is it? What is Al-Qaeda's goal? And what is the importance of Osama bin Laden. Rather than spoon feed you this one, since we're getting into more advanced lectures, I'd like you to read this on your own. Come to your own conclusions, your own answers to these questions. What is Al Qaeda? What is Al Qaeda's goal? What is the importance of Osama bin Laden? This is not, however, our only piece of secondary source scholarship to help us to understand bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Because we also have an article by Michael Doran, which was published in Political Science Quarterly in 2002, entitled The Pragmatic Fanaticism of Al-Qaeda on anatomy and extremism in Middle Eastern politics. Again, please read this article. It is important, it is interesting, and it includes information that you just don't find in the mainstream media, which tends to oversimplify complex situations such as Al-Qaeda. Michael Doran quotes from the Al-Qaeda field manual, if you will, to give insight into the organization. The beginning of the field manual, the guerrilla manual, whatever you want to call it, we find this statement. This statement tells us a great deal about Al-Qaeda's motivations. After the fall of our orthodox caliphates on March 3rd, 1924, on March 3rd, 1924, Ataturk, president of Turkey following World War I and the great westernizer, modernizer, and reformer that took 
a decrepit Ottoman Empire and turned it into the modern Republic of Turkey, the modern secular republic. In doing so, he abolished the 1,300-year-old line of caliphs that stretched back to Abu Bakr in 632. So, after the fall of our caliphates on March 3, 1924, and after expelling the European colonialists, something that happens after World War II in large measure, we've already talked about to a certain extent, Iran, for example, in Egypt, with Gamal Abdel Nasser, in the early 1950s. After expelling the European colonialists, our Islamic nation was afflicted with apostate rulers who took over. These rulers turned out to be more infidel and criminal than the colonialists themselves. Muslims have endured all kinds of harm, oppression, and torture at their hands. He is referring here to Anwar Sadat and his successor, Hosni Mubarak, in Egypt. Anwar Sadat, of course, the man who first recognized the State of Israel in 1978 in the Camp David Accords. Hosni Mubarak, his successor, who is still president on the quote-unquote throne of Egypt. He's referring to the Saudi royal family. He's referring to Saddam Hussein. This is a point that I cannot emphasize enough. Saddam Hussein, in the opinion of an Osama bin Laden and an Al-Qaeda, is worse than an American. Think about that for a second. We're bad, but we're not Muslims, so we can be excused a certain amount of our transgressions. But Muslim on Muslim crime, in Osama bin Laden's book, is far worse than Europeans or Americans putting Muslims under their thumbs, as had been the case much of the first half of the 20th century. The Saudi royal family is despised by Osama bin Laden. He's been expelled from the kingdom, not allowed to return, despite the fact that his father founded one of the most important companies in the country. A Muslim apostate, someone who has turned their back on their religion, is worse than the European colonialists. Therefore, the notion, the notion that Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein were working together is beyond preposterous. I can't actually think of a powerful enough uh, analogy in our own world to describe just how improbable that set of circumstances would be. It'd be like a Cowboys fan giving aid and comfort to a Giants fan, a Yankees fan, helping a Red Sox fan. But that doesn't even begin to describe the animosity which Osama bin Laden holds for people like Saddam Hussein, the Shah of Iran, the Saudi royal family, Hosni Mubarak, King Hussein in Jordan, the second Arab ruler, and thus far the last Arab ruler to recognize Israel in 1994. If I want you to come away from these lectures with one thing, it's that the notion of a link between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden is farcical, laughable, not to mention impossible. Got that? Good. It's not all that Michael Doran provides us with. It also provides us with the term Jahiliya, Dark Age. This is what Osama bin Laden 
and Al Qaeda refer to this present age as since 1924 as the Jahiliya, the Dark Age. And their goal is to refound the caliphate, to remove apostate Muslim rulers from their positions of power, and to restore what they believe was a more Muslim way of life before westernizing ideas infiltrated the region in the 20th century. The Jahiliya, the dark age in which we currently inhabit, according to Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. He also provides us with a statement by Osama bin Laden in November 2001, several months after the attacks on 9 11. In this statement, Osama bin Laden says, in the wake of the great strikes that hit the United States in its most important locations, in New York and Washington, a huge media clamor has been raised. People were divided into two parts. The first part supported these strikes against U.S. tyranny. Well, the second denounced them. Recall that President Khatami and Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei in Iran were quick to denounce these terrorist attacks. In the streets of Iran, in the days after 9-11, we saw thousands marching, chanting, Marg bar terrorist, death to terrorists. Much as we hear in the streets of Iran today, Mark Bar Dictator, death to the dictator, in this case, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda see the world in very black and white terms. You are with them or you are against them. There is no middle ground. Being a Muslim does not mean automatically that you are with them because they divide Muslims into two groups, apostates and true believers. True believers, of course, what they consider themselves to be. Apostates are people like Saddam Hussein and Hosni Mubarak and the Saudi royal family. Jahiliya. dark age. It's what they are seeking to bring it into restore, by restoring the caliphate. Let's go to the invasion. It was swift, it was impressive, and at the time it seemed to have been utterly decisive. It was a different kind of war. It didn't look like Operation Desert Storm. It was led by special forces, relied on the local population in large measure, the form of the Northern Alliance, to actually do much of the fighting. And by December of that year, 2001, the Taliban and Al Qaeda had been forced to retreat forced to retreat into the Tora Bora Mountains, which divide Afghanistan from its neighbor, Pakistan. This area has no government, neither on the Afghan side nor on the Pakistani side. Pakistan is right now engaged in a large-scale operation in what's known as the Swat Valley on their side of the border to root out Pakistani Taliban with, I would imagine, only moderate success because, after all, as we're going to see later, large segments of the Pakistani military and intelligence services believe that the Taliban, and by extension Al-Qaeda, is right. But that's for another lecture. 
December, we're feeling pretty good. We believe that we've got Osama bin Laden trapped in the Tora Bora Mountains, and it's only a matter of time. This map here gives you a sense of just what the lawless area is. Brown is mountainous, green is river valley. Though Pakistan's alleged border includes much of this brown area, they don't actually control it. If they did control it, their military wouldn't be engaged in large-scale operations to regain control, but now would they? We're going to return to this area, because it is in this area that Osama bin Laden is almost certainly hiding. That's for another lecture. Federally administrated tribal areas. No man's land. The Wild West. Terrain that, quite frankly, the American military was not prepared to deal with in a systematic and meaningful way because we simply didn't have the boots on the ground. You wouldn't know that, though, if you'd been reading the uh, glossy magazines at the time. I believe this appeared in uh, Time or Newsweek from around that time. Cornered. And we've got exciting graphics here, and we've got B-52s, and we've got Predator drones, and there's explosions, and it's all mapped out. It all looks very much like we've got the situation under control. But the reality on the ground here, at the end of 2001 and beginning of 2002, was quite the opposite. The very small number of special forces and U.S. soldiers that we had on the ground were overmatched by this terrain. Terrain they did not know, and that their enemy knew extraordinarily well because of their experience as guerrilla fighters during the 1980s and the Soviet invasion. So, uh, so whipped up did we become in the fall, winter, and spring of 2001 and 2002 with this campaign that we imagined our enemy to be much more powerful than they actually were. This uh, picture, entitled Bin Laden's Mountain Fortress, the top's cut off there, was actually displayed by Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, on the Sunday morning talk show Meet the Press with the late Tim Russer. Their exchange is priceless. I'll read it to you. Tim Russer. The Times of London did a graphic, which I want to put on the screen for you and our viewers. This is it. This is a fortress. This is very much a complex, multi-tiered bedrooms and offices on the top, as you can see, Secret exits on the side and on the bottom, cut deep to avoid thermal detection so when our planes fly to try to determine if any human beings are in there, it's built so deeply down and embedded in the mountain and rock, it's hard to detect. Well, here's a dirty little secret. You don't have to embed something very far in a stone mountain to make it impossible for heat sensing uh, equipment to actually find it. We oftentimes overestimate the ability of our technology. And over here, valleys guarded, as you can see, by some Taliban soldiers. Yes, there he is. There's a Taliban -y. A ventilation system to allow people to breathe and to carry on. An arms and ammunition depot. It's got its own hydroelectric power. <laughs> it's a very sophisticated operation. Rumsfeld. Oh, you bet. This is serious business. And there's not one of those. There are many of those. And they've been used very effectively. And I might add, Afghanistan is not the only country that has gone underground. Any number of countries have gone underground. The tunneling equipment that exists today is very powerful. It's dual use. It's available across the globe. And people have recognized the advantages of using underground protection for themselves. Nothing like this exists. Period. This was a way of comforting ourselves 
and explaining why we had not found a guy who seems to live much more like a shepherd than a warlord. So we decided, well, he must have this amazing complex, and there must be dozens of them, according to Donald Rumsfeld. That would help to explain why we hadn't found him by the spring of 2002. Simple fact of the matter is, after December and January of 2001-2002, focus shifted away from Afghanistan entirely. Resources were diverted, diverted to a little country called Iraq. 